Hi everybody, welcome to FDM Tech Week Day 2. Um, just to start off the session, we have introduction. My name is Cassandra. I'll be your host for today along with our panelists, Christoph and Ice, um, who are trainers and consultants with FDM Group. Um, but just before we start the session proper, we just wanted to start with a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, so just, just everybody knows this session will be recorded, but it's only for internal purposes. It will not be shared at any external platforms. Um, and at the same time, during the session today, if any of you have any questions at all, please feel free to just pop it into the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as we can get to towards the end of the session. Okay. Um, but just to move on, um, with regards to APEC Tech Week this week, as all of you know, this week is a week long of one hour sessions of different kinds of events. Um, so if you could just move on to the next slide, we could just talk a bit about those different events as well. So today we'll be talking about data as well as, you know, the power of data, the career progressions that you can look into for data as well. Um, and of course, we have one of our consultants with us today that can share a bit about her experience in data as well and how she came about um, just entering um, the FDM program as well. Okay, but of course, if any of you are interested in other sessions, for example, Python programming or presentation wise, um, please feel free to join us in subsequent sessions um, for the rest of the week. And you can just do that by registering in the QR code above over there. Okay, so nonetheless, let's get started. So Christoph, would you like to just kickstart the session for us, please? Thank you very much, Cassandra. So welcome everyone and thank you for your time today. We are going to spend about, yeah, uh, an, hour, an hour to discuss uh, the power of data. And I've named this presentation Unveiling the Power of Data because uh, there's a lot of power in, in knowing and being able to analyze data. And that's what we teach at FDM. And I just wanted to um, cover some facets, some you know, uh, aspects of how we can unveil the power of data. Feel free to ask me any questions. Like Cassandra said, yes, we have a time at the end of the presentation to ask questions. But if you want to stop me, don't hesitate to ask for clarifications or anything you'd like to ask along the way. All right, just to tell you a bit about myself. So unveiling the power of data, the goal, the, the goal of this presentation here. So who am I? I am the senior business intelligence trainer. Senior because I'm quite old. So um, that's why they call me the senior <laughs> business intelligence trainer. I've been with the company three years and uh, based in Sydney. Why? Do I talk to you about data today? It's because, yes, yeah, I've spent a long time in IT, 30 years, among which 25 years doing different roles in the business intelligence or data analysis, if you like, environment. I started a long time ago as a programmer, but those years as in business intelligence, uh, I spent it doing pre-sales work, technical work, technical support, selling software, and a lot, a lot of training. And I did train in Asia, in Australia, and in Europe. So that's about me. So I've, I've, been, I've been around, if you like. Do I have any special superpowers? Actually, I don't have any, but I have that um, belief that anybody can learn anything if you're motivated and if you, have, if you receive good training and you put the time, and practice, 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 you can learn anything. So that's uh, the aspect of the training here. I believe anybody can do, uh, can do anything with a bit of an effort and a lot of motivations. That's the key to anything. Anyway, let's talk about uh, the topic today. Unveiling the power of data. We have to discuss what's the problem with data today? What's the solution we can, uh, we can apply to address the problem? And this is all about dealing with data. And which role would you decide to take? Along the way, you will see in the slides explaining the different facets of unveiling the power of data. I will show you the different roles you could play and you could take on if you like. So at the end of the, the presentation, maybe you can think, you know, oh, which one would I like to do best? Because that's a good quality of um, all the data environment. You can do a lot of different things less technical, more technical, it, it's up to you and up of what you like. Anyway, first of all, the power of data. With data, 
as you know, you, you can't do anything. You can build those crazy buildings. You can deal with global warming. You can save elephants, send rockets to space, and, and also uh, feed the world. The, the thing is, being able to analyze that data, to understand what, what's happening around us and how to deal with it. The power of data is by being able to understand the data and therefore being able to take decision. So it seems easy, you know, it is, oh, I have data. I'm just going to look at it and I'm just going to, you know, analyze it and take decision. So what is the problem? So I just want to mention here that data uh, is all over the place, right? You can be in any field. You can be saving the world. You can be making millions for a company. You can be in finance. You can be anywhere. Data is everywhere. So what's the problem? The problem is data, especially these days, it's everywhere and there is a ton of it. And, and it's in different structures. It's a massive amount of it. And it's a bit like uh, being overfed, basically. A bit of food is good, too much food, you get sick. And that's the problem with the data today. The data, not only we have so much that we're getting a bit sick with it, and I put those questions on the right side. Can you trust the data you've been given or you're seeing or you're reading? Where is it coming from? How much should you look at? Uh, when was that data recorded? Why would I even look at that data in the first place? What support it is, it is on and so on and so forth. So there's large volume of information, different formats, and so many questions that come with it. So that's the problem. We have these days too much. And I said the power of data comes from being able to analyze it. So the issue and the main problem is there is so much that we find it very, very, very difficult to analyze the data and to be able to take the right decision. Most importantly, data without any context is completely useless. You just see numbers and numbers and numbers and if you cannot relate those numbers to a certain period of time, to a certain domain, to a certain level of extraction, you don't really know what you're looking at, basically. You're just looking at tons and tons of numbers that don't mean anything. So we have a problem of volume. We have a problem of where the data is coming from and what do we need. And we have another problem is giving context to the data. So what we teach and what business intelligence and data analytics in general is about, is giving the power to end user and, and everybody who needs data to be able to analyze that data easily. So how do we address that problem of having too much and in all coming from all directions without any context? It's basically different stages along the process. Like anything, when you want to do something smart, you need to sit down with whomever needs to do something and discuss what needs to be done. So in the business intelligence world or the data analytics world, there is a facet of it where you discuss what people want to do. You need to be specific because otherwise you would be shooting in all directions going nowhere. So deciding with people, first of all, what you want to achieve is the first stage. And the roles you have in those positions, you could be a business analyst, you could be a project manager, you could be those that kind of person that brings people together and is the glue between technical and non-technical people. Because these, these people you see in the room come from, it's not only business people. Data has a technical side and a non-technical side. And being a project manager or business analyst or a BI person is bringing people together and understanding and being the interpreter, you know, speaking all the language from the business at the same time, you have the technical language. So that's the first phase. Phase one, sitting down, analyzing what we need, analyzing the business requirements. So that's first facet to give the power to the data, unleashing or unveiling, you know, the power of data. So you see the roles? First of all, non-technical roles, just being people, you know, uh, organizing and analyzing the business requirements. Secondly, what we need to do 
and that's one of the metaphor I use all the time, and Ice would know about this one, is the data is everywhere in all different formats. It's a big mess. It's like you're in your room and you have all your clothes everywhere. and every, It's a mess, basically. So getting organized and centralizing the information. So in giving the power to data is to collect what you need, prepare the data, and centralize the information in a location where everybody can access it. It's a bit like that photo of a supermarket where you have eyes of products. You know, if you go to the supermarket, you don't need to buy everything. You just need certain things. So imagine that's your data. You go to the buying some cereals or some meat or some you know dairy products. You, there is an aisle for each section. It's different needs. Like in like in real life in a company, you need to address HR requirements or sales requirements or marketing. You know, we have placed that in different aisles and we have populated those aisles with products that are clean, neat, ready to use. You don't want to put on the shelf dirty products or damaged boxes or rotten fruits, right? So that's what happens with data. There is so much of it. We just handpick what we need. We make sure that it's all clean or we separate the good from the bad. All the damaged boxes, we put them aside and we put every data we need on shelves for people to fetch when they did it. So this activity is done, it's a bit more technical. It's an activity where you would have to deal with databases, such as you see at the bottom of the slide, SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, whatever database it is, using SQL, and we teach that language to interact with databases. And most importantly, ETL tools. ETL tools are those tools that can go somewhere, fetch something, prepare it, clean it, prepare it to be used, and load it somewhere, ETL. And we teach at LDM Visual Studio and SSIS, but there are millions of these tools. So we are in a technical world here. So after the first meeting we had discussing the business requirements, we come here and we try to build what normally people call a data warehouse, a place where we can put all the data we're going to give to end users to be able to use that data and take decisions. So the roles would be, for example, a data warehouse architect. So it's someone who knows databases and is able to do what we call data modeling, preparing the data for end user. You could be a database administrator, which is a very technical position making sure all that supermarket or database, if you prefer, works efficiently, is clean, well-organized, and is really ready to go. You could be a data architect, the person that organized things, you know, decide how to connect things to one another, a data engineer, or a data integration specialist. Those people are the ones using the ETL tools, the, the ones that are bringing the data in. So it's like, the data is like a flow of water, really. You, you need to control it and channel it to, be, to, be, to make sure the data goes in those locations you want. And very often we have first positions of consultants we have in this uh, field, the BI or data analytics. That's the first position they do. They do what we call data migration. They transfer data from one place to another one, filtering, analyzing, and cleaning that data. Quite interesting, but this is an area for technical people, people who like technical activities. You would use database, SQL, and ETL tools. I hope this makes sense to anyone. Like I said, if you have a question, ask me along the way. Otherwise, I just keep on talking. So meeting first, describing the business requirements. Secondly, preparing the data, selecting, extracting, collecting, preparing, and centralizing the information. Because one of the problem also is data is everywhere. And that's a big problem because you never know where to find what you need. Whereas if you put it in one central place, everything is, is good. So that was the second stage. So we will do, we do that. We'll teach you that at FDM. And finally, once you have prepared the data, modeled the data for whomever needs it and for the business requirements, you need to present it to the end user. In the past, all the data analytics were done by specific, by specific people, technical people that have received special, special training and all that. That has changed completely. These days, we have a need for instant data. You know, these days, nobody has time for anything. We want everything straight away. 
So once you've done the preparation work, another way to unleash the power of data is to present it nicely to the end user, making the information available to the end user. How would you do that? A common way to do it is to uh, use what we call self-service business intelligence, meaning a tool that anybody can use to build what we call dashboard. You see this image on this slide is an analytics dashboard whereby you would present in a very visual fashion uh, the result, the numbers. A dashboard is a visual representation of key information that people need to look at and understand to take decisions. Why this is so important? Because I could have, and in the past, that's what was happening. I would give you, or you would receive a file with like, you know, a million records in an Excel file, and you would have to build a pivot table, and you have all these numbers everywhere, but nothing jumps to your eyes. Nothing becomes so obvious. But when you build a dashboard, you get a map. You get a column chart, you get a pie chart with something highlighted in red, something high, something low. It's, it's a visual thing that it's obvious what's happening. Something is high, something is low. You can compare easily. You can see a progression. You can see a, a, a location. You can see colors on a map. So it's a very good way to present key information to end users. And this used to be done by specialists, you know, building those dashboards. But now you have tools, and you can see at the bottom of this slide, tools like Power BI or Tableau that are dashboarding tools that basically anyone can use. And it's an activity of dragging and dropping things on a canvas. And then you create the visuals, and then you can share it with the world. And then you can start creating discussion between the key players in whatever business you're working with. And then people can analyze results of a financial institution, or if we're talking about global warming, or you, you must have seen those dashboards about COVID, you know, when COVID was starting and going spreading everywhere, we had those red bubbles everywhere on a map saying, oh, this is bad, these people are, you know, here have been hit by COVID, this country is worse than this one, very visual dashboards. You can also build reports that you can send to everyone in the company by email. So you could have a very well-organized report, which is something that you need more to read about. It's, it's a bit more, a dashboard is very visual. A report is more something like more detailed, if you like. And you can build also uh, all up objects. I don't want to get technical, but there are objects in the BI world that you can pour data into it, like a, like a Rubik's Cube, if you like, and you can analyze your data. So I repeat from the beginning, you have the business analyst, analysis of the business requirement, very non-technical position, but you're like the, the glue. Then we do uh, collect the data, centralize the data. Then and when it's all modeled and ready to go, we give it to everyone saying, it's ready. Just jump into this product and build your dashboard. But as a BI person, you can build people can build their own dashboards but most of the dashboards in a company would be built by you or by the specialist so it's an interesting job whereby you combining artistic skills to um, data skills and um, you also share it with everyone so unveiling the power of data is also to make it visible to everyone in the company to you want the power of data lies into the fact that people can take decisions. And those decisions are conscious decisions. People are aware of what data, so they trust the data they have because you've prepared it nicely. People look at it because you've dispatched it to everyone. People talk about it because those tools allow conversations between the people. And the end result is people take the right decision. And that's what you want for a business, taking the right decision, being aware of a situation, being aware of comparing things and deciding what you should do for the future. Does that make sense? So at the, at the bottom here, so the, the roles would be, you would be a dashboarding specialist. So people build dashboards day in, day out, interesting position. You could be the one that build the reports, or you could be a, a more generically called a business intelligence developer, 
someone who just has a bit of touch a bit of the dashboard, build some those cubes, you know, to analyze the data and build the reports. You can do a bit of everything, business intelligence developer. And it could get technical using some languages such as R, Python, and things like that. So there's also a facet of being a, a data person is a bit of programming, if you like, like programming that would allow you to go a step further. That's what we're gonna discuss in the last slide. Okay, the last slide is about the future. So that would be the last facet of unleashing the power of data. I'm actually having a storm right now and I was thinking of where I am, it's, it's pouring rain. And I was thinking of the weather. I don't know if you remember, but the weather, well, my generation, people were trying to predict the weather and had no idea what they were talking about. They would say, tomorrow is going to rain and it would be a sunny day and vice versa. By collecting a lot of data, and that's a good example of where the power of data lies, you know, we can collect a lot of data. We treat that data, we prepare that data, and we can analyze that data. But it goes to a certain extent, right? You can look only at the past and the present. That's the data you've been collecting. So you can say, well, in the last 10 years, it has been raining every month of July, right? So it's got, there's a good chance it's gonna, rinse in it's gonna rain in July. But there are some tools, I have a question here. I have, there are some tools that can look at the current data and using algorithms and statistical processes, if you like, can very, in a technical way, predict the future. I'm just gonna have a look at that question first because I said you can ask questions along the way. What is the difference between data engineer and a business analyst? That would be, uh, one position is technical, the other one is not. So a business analyst is very much that person that listen to the business requirements, organize meetings, have that capacity of understanding what's required in a business sense and establish a plan of action kind of thing without doing any technical work. You know, it's kind of like a, establishing a, how we're gonna deal with that requirement and how we're gonna implement a solution. That would be a business analyst. The data engineer is the, the mechanics working on a car, you know? That's the person that is dealing with the engine, the components, the bits and pieces. So data-wise, it's the person uh, uh, doing uh, the collecting of the data, the preparation of the data, the splitting of the data, the arranging the numbers, modeling the data in a way that it's it becomes usable. So that would be a data engineer, a technical position that, that deal with data. The data engineer would have to know about SQL, would have to know about different data formats, you know, would have to know maybe a bit of Python and so on and so forth. So data engineer, technical in, in a nutshell, if you like, business analysis is more the business side. I hope that was answering your question. Uh, going along, so I was talking about the last stage of unleashing the power of data, looking at the future, because these days, it used to be enough to say, well, we're selling a lot of these products, so let's keep on doing that and our business is gonna do fine. But these days, um, we need to be more reactive because the competition is so fierce and there are so many people trying to do the same things. We need to anticipate as much as we can what the world is gonna be tomorrow. And how do we do that? Looking at the past and the present is not enough anymore. We need to build mathematical kind of approach to analyzing the data and project ourselves into the future. Some very smart software or statistician, mathematician could do that as well, could analyze data, feed it into a machine or an algorithm or a software that has some built-in projections based on what topic you're dealing with and what kind of data you have and how much data you have. And we'd say the next three years are gonna look like this. We've been selling those products a lot, but in the next two years, it's not gonna be the case. We got, this is gonna happen. And this is a more complex task because 
it's not just looking at facts. You know, we sold that many products last year. That's not enough. It's the correlation between data. Why it's, it's answering questions like why and how, and what if I was changing this? You know, there is correlation between information and data. And this area predicting the future, which is called predictive or yeah, predictive analytics, is more about which data impacts which. How come uh, suddenly people decide to buy such a product? There is something that has triggered that movement. And that's what this area is about, trying to understand what the market will be tomorrow, where is the market going, without really knowing, by just analyzing very well what was the past, injecting some correlation parameters, and then you get an estimation of what the future would, would be like. And that's what happening with the weather. Well, actually, I was talking about the weather. These days, we give you the weather, and you know it's going to be the weather for the next maybe three or four days. It's that precise because algorithm have analyzed the patterns of weathers that it's a lot of data that was collected by a lot of, uh, you know, whatever. And, and all that data is fed into those engines and the engines will tell you what weather is gonna be. And it's so precise, they can predict, you know, whatever, typhoons or even a light rain. And that's part of, you know, growing new, uh, new things in different fields in different parts of the world or you see like i was saying data can turn into anything you can it can touch anything in this role you would have more like a data scientist i put analytics manager but maybe forget about this one a researcher so that's just people diving in the data and trying to foresee things a marketing analyst a statistician a market research analyst. So in, in this area, predicting the future, uh, you need to have a bit of a background. You cannot just say, I'm going to do that because I fancy like, I want to predict the future. No, no, you cannot do that. You, you need to have a, a certain mathematical background or you, you have to know about statistics, algorithms. So it needs, that's a very technical area. But it's also a good mix. And that's the good thing with data. Data is never standalone, it's never a full on technical or a full uh, business position. It's always a mix. It's a blend of technical and non-technical. That's why it's an interesting position to do or to be in. But out of the blend, you can lean towards technical or you can lean towards more towards a business kind of things. Okay? So recapping very in a nutshell, the main areas, the business side where we discuss the requirements, the technical side where we collect the data we need and we prepare it for use, then the dispatching of that data to everyone, and finally, the predicting the future. All this, you can call it business analytics if you want, or data analytics. And with those steps, we go from a big pile of data that doesn't make any sense to little models that everybody can use to extract the good information and analyze data in a very precise way. You want to give the power to the data, but also the power you want to give the data to as many people as you want. And by doing that, you channel it, you prepare it, and then you dispatch it. You know that people will take the right decision because it's good to take a decision, but you want to take the right decision. And only by doing those stages, those steps, you can deal with the proper data and you can give proper context to the data. All right, almost there. I just want to show you the, uh, the last slide. So that's it. That slide is just showing you that the power of data is to give it to as many people as you want. The goal of this, delivering, promoting, and empowering people to make the right decision. A data person, a person that deals with data analytics has to be uh, a person that does advertising. You promote, you promote the data. You, you have to tell people that you've done that good work and it's there for them, for them to use because only when people use what, you, what you've prepared, that data you have prepared, that's where the, when the power would be unleashed because HR will, will take very clever decisions. This group, this researcher will have finally the, the information that we're waiting for. The, the rocket scientists, you know, they've understood that some parameters have changed something and then they need to adapt to that, you know? So delivering that data, that's what we do as well. 
mostly with those tools that I talked about, those dashboarding tools that allow people to see the data and discuss around that data. So why would you choose this, this field of data analytics? It's a summary of what I was discussing, but it's an interesting job. It's problem solving day to day. It changes all the time. You have to fix things. You have to analyze things. It's interesting. Like I said, it's a good mix of technical and communication skills. You cannot just be technical or just be business person. You need to have that multifaceted kind of personality. But like I said, you can lean towards one or another, like business or technical. It's transferable. Once you're good with data, once you know, obviously we teach also Excel, SQL and all that. Being good with data helps in any field, in any careers, anywhere. It's going to be a, a, a new, um, I forgot, to, an arrow in your quiver, something like that. You know, it's you can use it anywhere. Flexible hours and environments, well, that can be discussed. Um, there is so much you can find about the topic that you can learn on your own. You, you don't need it. And it's, and it's a, a field where you, you have to be a doer. You have to do things. That's what I like about it. You produce things. So you don't need so much degrees and you know saying, I can do this. You, you have to really do it and you produce things. I like that. I saw a question. It's coming back to you in a minute. Plenty of learning resources, wide variety of available opportunities. You can work saving the elephants. You can work in sending rockets to the moon, but you can also work like in finance. It goes anywhere. Data is everywhere. Okay. And it's normally, a, well, it's on average, a well-paid job. I just put a number on this. It, you know, I just fetched that. And also it's a position. I've, I was reading yesterday, 25% growth. There is a massive need for people uh, being able to analyze data and prepare the data for everyone else. So there's growth, there is money, it touched many fields. But most importantly, you can make a difference to the world by just working with data. You know, sometimes you want to feel something, you want to feel that you're doing something useful. Data can take you anywhere. Just pick a field. And from a base, a common base of teaching that we will teach you how to deal with data, you can empower that data to any field you want. And that's, you can find yourself, you know, working anywhere. Very interesting. You could be in research, could be analyzing radiation or, like I said, saving elephants. So that's why it's also a very good field to, to learn. So I'm just going to check that question where we're here. When you say about predicting future with algorithm, are you talking about using Python, SQL, or using Power BI Tableau? Power BI and Tableau do not predict the future. Dashboarding is showing the facts to everyone, showing facts, even though some of the tools in Tableau are, you know, there are some visualization that show you a bit of the future. But if you want to do it right, yes, you need to do a bit of Python. It depends. You could use softwares. There are softwares that are fully dedicated and, and come with algorithm, preset algorithm. You don't have to do anything. You just need to be able to decide which algorithm to use in which scenario, which is not easy. You need to have that knowledge. It's like a toolbox. Which tool should I use to put a nail in the wall? If you're completely uh, you're born yesterday, you have no idea. Uh, so for you to answer your questions, Predicting the future, it's more technical. It's more with, uh, not SQL. Python would be a tool we use. SQL is just a language to extract from a database that wouldn't predict anything. What you need is algorithm. Things that deal with multiple variables ingested and that perform some analytics. So you could write it yourself with Python or R, or you could ask a software to do it for you. There are different things uh, you could use, but not the dashboarding tool. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Uh, so this is what I got for you, really. So now we, what we have, we have Ice with us. She did the the class brilliantly, and she <laughs> she's gonna tell you. I just told her to say only nine things about the class because I was the trainer. No, she's going to tell you frankly what she thinks about it. 
what she enjoyed, what she didn't enjoy. Oh, well, that you can skip that part. And what was the feeling about the class? Okay, so I hope this was very useful. Uh, Ice. Yep. It's all yours. Okay. Thank you, Crystal. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ice. So actually, I joined the FDM on August in the business intelligence stream. And recently, just what Christoph say, I complete the training in last week. And at the moment, I'm waiting for the placement. So I can talk about a little bit about my background. So I study my Master of IT in Tasmania. And actually, my previous job was working as a diver in the agriculture industry, which is not very related to the IT or data. But however, I, I understand myself is want to work something is related to data or I very like to work with number. That is why at the moment I decide to relocate into Melbourne and find more opportunity. And I'm very happy that uh, FDM gave me this opportunity and provide me the amazing training before I start working with the big company or work with the client. So I joined FDM because I think this program has given me good opportunity to start my career in, in technology with training before you, you start working with the client. And after training, I can get some qualification or work with the other big bank or financial company. So that's the reason. And for the class, I can share a bit about uh, during my training. Overall, I quite enjoyed the course, honestly, because I think it's quite well planned and easy for me to follow. But uh, for first two weeks, the course is quite intense. But after that, I'm used to it and I could finish all the tasks with enough time and learn about each topic very well and will not feel very overloaded and rushed. So the course was quite fun because I enjoy and I like to learn the the, the data stuff, how to clean it, how to uh, uh, select it, how to use SQL or database to, to, to get the data. So in the course, just what Christoph say, we'll learn about the Excel, SQL, how to do the ELT and how to visualize the data from Power BI. So for myself, uh, just, just talk a little bit about my experience. I think some, uh, topic is quite fast so every day I will catch up uh, maybe spend half hour to do the revision and take the looks and make sure I I understand all the knowledge and that's the good thing for me to make the habit and I also very much like the session that after I did all the technical training get all the knowledge we will have a small project so I can use all the techniques that I learned in the training. And in that moment, I can understand what I don't know or I which part I'm not familiar with or how to apply it in the small project. That's the thing I think is very interesting and useful for me for the future or at the, yeah, to get a job as well. And one thing, and I like that, I like the trainer because honestly, I think it's, very experienced and helpful. Just Christoph Lowe, I always ask him a question about if you want, if you're interested or want to explore more, you can do it. And just just ask the trainer and then they were very helpful to, to answer your question. And then they could always share their real world experience and guide you how to do the right check and what's the right solution. So I thought the cost class was pretty good and I learned quite a lot from this class and I have a solid understanding about the database the uh, standard used to query them and additional database formats and how to use the tool like SSIS the SSMS the SQL Server Management Studio and how to use the Power BI to 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 do the final step to show the, our result so I think this is give me a very good kick start my technical career. What what did you what facet did you like the most? Because we have covered last question. I'm, I'm asking a question. Mm -hmm. 
because we're covering all these facets I was presenting in, in, in the PowerPoint. Which did you like the most, the business side or the dashboarding or extracting or databases? or What would you I see yourself doing best? I really like the ELT because this one is very technical. And I like to do how to uh, logically to split the data, how to uh, see what's the process I need to do before I show it in the Power BI. So I like the technical stuff because it's not easy to get the knowledge from the website or YouTube because just sometimes I will learn by myself, but mm. uh, they have different resources. You don't know which one is right or wrong. But this course, I know how which way which way is is the process is is correct. It's better to do it, so I can use it. So ELT for me is the the best one. And it's quite a practical course, also. Wasn't yeah. It? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Ais. Cassandra. Yeah. Thanks, Ais, for sharing. Thanks, Christoph. Um, yes. I think that was really great. Um, maybe just before we move on, I, I do have a question for you. Um, I do understand, you know, that previously, um, prior to you joining FDM, you did work as an assistant business analyst before. Um, Christoph did mention that, you know, during his earlier slides, I was wondering if you could share with us a bit about your experience and, you know, of, of course, how does it relate to what Christoph has shared with us just now? Sorry, yeah, so I do understand um, I said you worked as an assistant business analyst prior. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could share with us your experience as a assistant BA and of course, um, you know, how it's related to what Christoph has shared with us earlier in the slides. Yeah, uh, before I have worked a while the assistant business analysis, but uh, I have talked more about my background. Actually, my background is the, uh, my bachelor is studied chemistry. So, uh, but after that, I got a job as assistant business analysis, and this is the first step I start doing the business or data step, data stuff. And I think this is very interesting to me. That's why I decided to study the, the, the master of IT. And during the training, uh, I saw that how to use, how to treat data, uh, how to prepare the, the data is the precept, uh, teach me how is related to to my previous job, I would say, because I I don't have any tech leave from the before my previous job, and I think this course is what, what I mentioned is ELT, is the one thing is now is very popular no matter which industry, so this technique can be used from any any industry. It's not just the IT uh company. You could overuse it in the marketing company as well because before I work in uh, like the marketing uh, company so I was an assistant business analysis so I will touch a little bit about data but it's not for it because I'm not as the uh, very technical because I'm not studying the mainstream of IT so that's why I, I, I like this course because it teach me quite a lot of real world what I need and yeah yeah Fantastic. We're, Thanks, we have, guys. We have a question, Cassandra. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah 100%. So um, definitely we do see some questions coming in and just that's great because we are heading into the Q&A portion of it now. Um, so we just answered the questions according to order of them coming in. Um, but definitely if any of the audience do have any more questions, please feel free to keep it going. We'll get to it just in quite a bit as we do have about 15 minutes for the Q&A portion. So just on the first question, actually, there was a follow-up question on a previous one. So the previous question was, what is the difference between data engineer and business analyst? So I believe Christoph has answered that question. But following that, there was a question that asked that, you know, does Christoph mean that both roles can do the same thing? It's just that the methods they use are different. Christoph, what do you think? Can both roles do the same thing? Yeah. So does it mean that, you know, as a BA and as a data engineer, are they, you know, are they performing the same functions, but just using different methods or how does it work? So what it, what happens, it depends on the size of the client, basically. Some very large companies compartiment every task very specifically. So you would have a person to do data migration, 
you would have a, a business analyst, you would have this, you would have that. It's like a, like a chain of, of activity. So you would be dedicated to a single task. And that's okay, but it's not, it's a bit limiting if you like what, what you want to do. And it's very possible that you are a, a person uh, that does multiple things in, in the process of, you know, preparing and analyzing the data and giving that data to everyone. So you could, in a smaller company, being the person analyzing the requirements and all the way to doing it yourself. But that would be a really, really small company. At least you would have a database administrator. You would have normally business analysts are very, uh, they're like 80% business and 20% technical. But uh, uh, you could be the, to answer this question, you could be the one doing many things many different things it's not it really depends which company you're going to work on i have been doing sitting down in meetings and 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 listening to the business requirement digesting it myself i am not a business person i'm more like a technical person and i would i would hear what they say i was doing pre-sales when i was when i was younger and pre-sales is that we're selling software we hear what they want we prepare a demonstration of technical presentation of how we can address this problem and then we deliver the solution later when we sell the product so yes so it's a yes you can do you can be the one person doing multiple tasks or in a larger company you, it could be very compartmented if you like yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Christoph, for clarifying. Um, just with the next question, it is more of a recruitment question, so I will take this question. So what are the eligibility requirements in the FDM program and if there's any visa requirements? Um, so for the FDM program, we do require for all our candidates to at least have a bachelor's degree. Um, it doesn't matter what degree you come from, whether it's STEM or non-STEM. Um, as you have heard from Aisha, now she comes from a chemistry background, which is very different from what she's doing now. Um, and we're quite happy to take in anybody who is just interested in technology. Um, just with regards to visa requirements, it does depend on the location that you are in. So for example, if you are currently based in Australia, you would require, or we would require for you to eat, at least be either a citizen, a permanent resident, or have a valid visa that lets you stay in Australia for at least 2.5 years. Okay. Um, in the respective other APEC regions of Singapore, Hong Kong, and China, we do require for you to either be a citizen or a permanent, re permanent resident um, in those specific countries. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Um, the next question will be for ICE. So ICE, there is someone that's asking, you know, how long is the program that you are currently enrolled in? And when it comes to your placement, how long would it be? So for the program is uh for the BI stream is roughly is uh, around a month, around four to five weeks, and then the placement uh is the two year placement. So for the placement is according to uh what you're interested in, and then the account manager will assign you to the interview. Uh, for my for my case, uh, I'm have an interview to the ANZ in Australia. So yeah, at the moment, I'm waiting the, the, the result and see how it's going, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Just to add on to that, um, for most of our consultants, the placements will be on average about one year. Um, some will even go on for the full two years with just one single, single client. So of course, in Isis' case, if she's successful, she would be placed with ANZ for at least one year, um, at most for the full two years in the graduate program. Okay, so I hope that was quite clear. Um, with regards to the next question, I think it's more of a concern. Um, this will be quite interesting to hear from both Ice and Christoph. So this person has said that, you know, they're a bit weak and a bit scared of um, statistics. Do you think that they should still apply for the business intelligence rule? Christoph, maybe you want to go first? Yep, actually, yeah. yeah I, I like this question because I am not a statistician whatsoever and I have no idea about statistics. And I'm not interested, frankly. So it's a, it's a question of taste. So don't be don't be scared if you don't know statistics. You don't need it. If I want to um, to caricature, no, okay, make, make a caricature of it. Business intelligence is more about dealing with the past and the and the present, and you don't need you need zero statistics, zero math. You just need a logical mind. You need to be able to be organized, uh, and and know about how to deal with data, how to model it, how to prepare it. So no statistics now. So don't be scared at all. You can do, and actually business intelligence does not require any statistical 
a knowledge. Now, because there are different terms, business intelligence deal with past and present data. Now, predictive analysis and business analytics and, and that extension to, to business, in, it's not an extension, it's the next stage, if you like. Now you need statistics. If you want to, to work in that predictive analytics, it's called predictive analytics, you must know statistics. You don't, well, you don't have to, but you would be so limited if you don't. So it's up to you. But for business intelligence, no, you don't need statistics. Lai, do you know anything about statistics? Uh, not really. I just study a, a module before I study mm -hmm. uh, my master of degree, but not very deep about the statistics. Yeah, so okay, I don't think so. we need no. very, yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thanks very much, um, Ice and Christoph for the input. So hope that attendee feels a bit better now. Um, as you can tell, even our recruit, even our trainers and our consultant doesn't have a background in stats. Um, so you should be fine as long as you are really keen on, of course, a DI type of role. And just another question for Ice actually. Um, so Ice, how was your experience in the recruitment process with FDM? So for example, how did you prepare, and what do you think is the key takeaway from the entire recruitment process? Uh, I would say the main thing is uh, the motivation. If you really like to work in the technology the field, so no matter what background or what uh, knowledge, I mean, what degree you have, uh, you can express your motivation, why you like it. And because if you like the, the technology, you will know about the news. So you can have have um, some knowledge about what's going on in the world right now about the data. And yeah, and how I prepare. Mm, uh, for some people maybe have also have some experience about their part-time job or other, other kind of job. So you can think about any transfers, transferable skill that you can apply that uh, in, your, in, in, in the other jobs. So yeah, you can think about your all the experience you can use it for the future. Yeah, that's what I did. And what will you take away for whole recruitment process? Uh, for myself, I think it's pretty smooth uh, to go one step by one step. Uh, you will, the first step, what I, what I remember, and then Cassandra, you can, yeah, to mention a bit. I uh, got a phone interview about us about your eligibility, about your visa, uh, while you apply. And, and then after that, you will receive an email to do the, uh, the uh, video interview and some technical uh, test. And after that, you will go to the final final process about uh, have like online face-to-face -face, uh, the interview with the uh, manager, with the technical uh, trainer about uh, do some logical tests and then do the interview, yeah. So it's, it's my whole process for myself. Yeah, yeah, thanks guys for sharing. So yeah, if I could just add on, so throughout the recruitment process, there will be a dedicated recruiter assigned to you. Um, and this recruiter will give you feedback and just guidance along the way so that you can better prepare for each stage of the recruitment process. Um, so not to worry too much, we'll take good care of you as long as you're a candidate with us, okay? So I hope that does answer the question. Um, just another recruitment uh, question, just following up. There is a candidate who completed um, a certificate for in cybersecurity in 2022, but have also completed their bachelor's about 10 years ago, and whether they'll still be able to apply to the FDM program. So the answer to this is yes, definitely do feel free to apply to the FDM program. Um, once we have received your application, we will go through your application together with all the other candidates. And if you are shortlisted for the recruitment process, we will definitely reach out with you and just begin the recruitment process as what I had gone through previously as well, okay? So yeah, no restrictions in terms of that manner, as long as you've completed a bachelor's. And just one um, more question, just aware of time as well. So I think we'll just take this last question. Um, what are the opportunities at FDM after the graduate program? Um, that's a really, really great question. Um, and that is also, maybe I can answer a bit and then Christoph can follow up after. So generally speaking wise, the entire graduate program here is two years. 
And within that two years, we do expect for you to have gained really great skills, experiences, and the network in the respective area that you're going to be in. So for example, um, let's say we look at ICE. ICE have, of course, just started that journey with us. She's done the training. She's going for her placement next. So during her placement, she'll get really great experience with the clients and their projects, and also build her own network of professional connections in the workplace. So after the two years, um, you know, if your client has enough headcount and if they're really happy to take you on board, you could also transition over to them on a permanent um, kind of manner. And then that's where you would start to see your career progression, whether is it going into a more technical role or whether is it advancing into some sort of leadership uh, style type of position. It really depends on, you know, at that two-year mark, what you want to do. Of course, the other alternative as well is for you to stay on with FDM as a senior consultant and potentially look at other opportunities um, that we have available at that point of time. So for example, if let's say, you know, let's say ICE gets placed as maybe as a data analyst, right, with ANZ, um, for example, and maybe after two years, ICE wants to perhaps transition into a data engineering role. So that's when we would see, you know, of course, whether we have the right opportunities for her. And if we do, then that will be a good fit and we'll find out whether ICE requires any other additional training to sort of add on to her experience, okay? So those are just examples of, you know, what you can achieve within FDM. Um, but Christoph, what do you think outside of FDM? What, where can they go into? Uh, we've seen different scenarios, but the classic scenario is you've been placed somewhere, they're happy with you, you're doing a good job, and then after two years, you, you stay with that client that you like, and that's normally what happens. That's the classic scenario, but we've seen people working for us, for FDM, deciding to become trainers, deciding to, be, to become salespeople, and so you can have a career at FDM. And there is another path whereby you could be, um, you know, a freelancer working on your own, you know, just um, marketing yourself and selling your, your services to clients on your own, if you want. But that's pretty, that's pretty, I would say that's the rarest of the scenarios. Classic scenarios is staying with the clients you've been placed because you build connection. You, if you like it, they like you. I mean, that, that's the best. That's the best way for you. And and then you you extend your your contract, and they would offer you a contract if you're doing a good job. I mean, which, which clients? It's an investment for a client to to recruit you to take you on board. They don't want to lose you. I mean, you know, you're a good you good asset. They would like to keep you, and that's what happens most of the time. So I said, extra cherry on the cake. You can work for FDM for us if you want. Well, we have offered positions. We have offered position to a few people. Yep, yep, exactly as Christoph has mentioned. So I hope that was quite clear. Um, I'm just quite aware of time, so unfortunately, we would have mm. to stop the Q&A portion here. Um, and of course, if any of you are still keen on finding out more, please feel free to scan the QR code on the screen. Um, it will lead you to a landing page where you'll see all the available opportunities we have. And of course, if you're interested, do get in contact with us and we'll have the initial chat with you as well. But otherwise, that's pretty much it for today's session. Really appreciated all your attention. We hope that you benefited from it. And of course, we look forward to seeing you at future Tech Week events as well. So thanks, everybody. Have a good week ahead.